Well, what an evening to gather together. Uh, for us, this evening would be comparable to coming to the funeral of your dearest friend. Easter is uh, the resurrection celebration, but tonight is the fullness of comprehending what it means that Jesus Christ became our sins. If you take your Bible, 2 Corinthians 5 is where we're gonna be in verse 21. And basically, one verse in the Bible summarizes this greatest week in the history of all that we know of in the universe. One verse capsulizes and God reduces down exactly what he was doing from Palm Sunday through today all the way through Easter Sunday in this one verse, the 21st verse. God sends us what may be the most crucial, powerful, and vital verse in all of God's word, the Bible. In fact, if you wanted one verse to make sure you really understood the, the depth of what God was communicating as far as it relates to everything that matters to us forever, it would be this verse, it would be the 21st verse. This one verse sums up what I say would be everything that matters forever. So think of it tonight because tonight is very sobering. When, when we really plumb the depths of what God is doing, in fact, over 500 years ago, Martin Luther was, was studying as a new believer the implications of Christ's death on the cross, and especially when he was reading Christ's words saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And Luther said he was going away, and he was gonna spend an entire week uh, alone, contemplating, studying, and, and, and coming to an understanding of what it meant that God forsook his son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus. At the end of the week, he came back to his pulpit at Wittenberg, and he said, he said, it's so deep. He said, I understand less now than when I left. And he told the people that the simplicity is as God states. So look at the 21st verse here, because we get to see God's summary of why Jesus had to come as the Lamb of God. That's what we talked about on Palm Sunday. The Lamb of God, God's choice from eternity past, that Jesus would come to be the Lamb of God. But God explains that to us, that he had to come to suffer the wrath of God on the cross. And our theme this Good Friday evening is that the real Jesus is the one who faced the wrath of God. Now, each of the phrases of this verse break down into the elements of, of what we're looking at this week, and I'll just remind you of each of them. It says at the beginning of the verse, 21, for he made him who knew no sin. Now, notice it says he made him. How many times did Jesus tell his disciples, I must needs go to Jerusalem. I will be taken by sinful hands and I will be delivered up and I will be lifted up. And Jesus repeatedly explained his crucifixion as something that God had chosen for him and he must obey. So Palm Sunday, when Jesus presented himself as the Lamb of God, it was Jesus saying that God the Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to come as that Lamb of God. So we celebrated that. But now tonight, look at the middle of that verse. To be sin for us. That's Jesus facing the wrath of God. That's the cross. That's Good Friday. That's what we're looking at tonight. Jesus being made sin for us. Now Paul's talking to the believers, he's talking to the church, he's talking to, to all the saints throughout all the centuries that read and believe and, and understand through the Spirit's power of the Word of God, and he's saying that Jesus on the cross became every sin that I've ever committed, that Paul's ever committed, that all of us in this room have ever committed. Jesus became, God treated him like he was sinning, like we have. Then the end of the verse is the glorious celebration that we will share on Sunday 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is Jesus, risen as the son of God, declared to be the son of God with power. The one who came to seek and to save the lost does and, and offers eternal life to all, but only because he became sin and only because he was the lamb of God. So this verse distills it all in one small 16 Greek words. Well, the lamb of God faced the wrath of God. The Lamb of God who came on Palm Sunday is the one who faced the wrath of God on the cross on Good Friday. And welcome to the second stop in our journey through the greatest week in history of the universe. On Palm Sunday, we saw that Jesus was from eternity past the Lamb of God slain for sinners. But the event is tonight. And this is ground zero of the wrath of God. This is the event that all of history points toward. Jesus Christ became sin. Jesus became the object of the focused wrath of God on sin. And so, for us, as we saw on Palm Sunday, Good Friday marks the purpose of God since before he created anything. God the Father displayed his wrath poured out upon his own son. He punished Jesus for your sins and mine so that God's great mercy could be seen as he forgave us undeserving sinners. But see, all forgiveness, all all of our sins needed a payment and Jesus became that payment in our place. It's the substitute. It's the the sinless one who took the sinner's place and God poured his wrath upon him. And so, it would be very important for us to understand the wrath of God. Now, wrath of God is not a popular topic. In fact, it it doesn't probably in Google's, you know, analysis of our lives, uh, doesn't make it very often in the search engine as, as a big hot topic. But the more we understand it, the more tonight comes across our minds as what it was that God was doing. Think of the wrath of God this way. God's wrath, first of all, is fearsome. Uh, when, When you think about God's wrath, think of the countless people who watched the earth get covered by water in Noah's flood. And think about the fact that God killed every man, every woman, and every child but Noah and his family. There was no mercy on the others. None else were spared God's wrath but the aid in the ark. Now that's a little glimpse of God's wrath. That God didn't say, oh, well, some of them are screaming so loud, and oh, some of them have tried so hard, I'll just send out a couple lifeboats. God drowned them all, all of them. God's wrath, when it's let loose, is a fearsome thing. God's wrath is also merciless. Just ask those seen in the incineration of Sodom and Gomorrah. Every human but four were mercilessly burned and buried. Every man, every woman, every child died. And you say, is that that fair? Well, they were all guilty sinners. And they did not receive God's mercy. They deserved his wrath, and they became a display of, God's wrath is merciless. God's wrath is also inescapably horrible. Just ask the families of the firstborn of Egypt. Not one of any age was spared. Every firstborn perished as a destroyer invaded every home and stable that did not obediently have an innocent lamb's blood put on the doorway. God's wrath is inescapably horrible and God's wrath is globally coming. Just think of those trapped on earth in the future. The wrath of God is poured out in a solar storm and meteorite shower and plagues and pestilences and murder and warfare and starvation and demon beasts allowed to stalk every human, gripped by fear and terror and hiding. In fact, the Bible says every other human on earth will die horribly in just a matter of those horrific 42 plus months of the great tribulation. God's wrath is globally coming. God's wrath is fearsome. God's wrath is unstoppable. It's inescapable. It's dreadful. It's horrible. It's beyond description. But the clearest display 
Is not the flood of Noah's day or the fire and brimstone of Abraham and Lot's day or the destroyer of the firstborn of Egypt in Moses' day? None of those compare with Good Friday's display. Because all those were spread out. His wrath was spread out in every one of them. It's going to be spread out over all the earth in the end. It's spread out over all the earth at the beginning in the flood. But on Calvary, all of God's wrath was focused in one place. All of that fearsome, unstoppable, inescapable, dreadful, horrible, beyond description wrath. But Calvary is God's fiercest wrath. Every other outpouring of wrath was upon a group of individuals. Even the wrath of God justly expressed in the, in the eternal torments of hell will be varied depending on the person's awareness of God's law. But on the cross, all of God's holy wrath was consecrated and focused on that one person. Now look back at verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. Because Jesus on the cross as the Lamb of God faced God's full wrath against the sin of the world. In the process, what the scriptures say is that God treated Jesus like he was guilty of everyone's sin for whom he died. Of everyone's sin as the Lamb of God for the sin of the world. God treated him like, and focused like a laser all that wrath on him. That's, that's the fierceness Jesus compressed all of our eternal debt payments to God into one horrible six-hour stretch. Good Friday was good for us. It was bad for Jesus. In fact, it was the longest day in the universe. Think of how concentrated on Christ was the lifetime of all people that had sinned on this earth. There's an element, actually two sides to what Christ suffered. Theologically speaking, Jesus paid the penalty in one sacrifice for the sin, the totality, as Spurgeon said. Jesus paid for the totality of the mass of the sin of every human that ever lived. That, that's called the, the sufficiency. The, the breadth of his sacrifice was sufficient for all, but specifically or theologically efficiently Jesus actually paid for the lifetime of my sin and of your sin and of all who would ever trust in Christ. All those lifetimes of sin were compressed into six hours. It's an amazing concept. And Jesus, in those six hours, faced the compressed eternal wrath of God for all who would ever believe, reduced down to six hours. Very hard to understand. That's why Luther came home from his retreat. He said, I don't understand how God did it, but I'll just preach and proclaim and believe it. And so, as we saw on Sunday, Jesus was a lamb of God lifted up as Moses did the brazen serpent, and Jesus was a lamb of God that faced God's wrath as David saw in the 22nd Psalm. But all of those pictures tell us that God sacrificed his son for my sins, for your sins. See, the historic Christianity says that Jesus suffered and bled and died. Saving faith says Jesus suffered and bled and died for my sins. See, the personal element of the reception of the sacrifice. Jesus was crucified during Passover week there were two calendars followed by the Jews in Christ's time. The northern or Galilean calendar went from sunrise to sunrise. The southern Judean calendar went from sundown to sundown. This allowed for everyone to celebrate the intricacies of the Passover when the city was overflowing with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pilgrims. Being Galilean, Jesus and his disciples considered Passover day to have started at sunrise on Thursday and to end at sunrise on Friday. So the Jewish leaders who arrested and tried Jesus, being mostly priests and Sadducees, considered Passover to begin at sunset. Therefore, through the predetermined sovereign provision of God, Jesus could legitimately celebrate Passover, and so he did with his disciples. His disciples. 
And so he celebrated the Passover meal like all the Galileans on the night before Jerusalem celebrated theirs. In the first half of the 256,000 lambs that were probably slain were slain on the same day as Christ celebrated the first half of them. And so the blood that was shed in the Temple Mount went down a pipe that drained into Kidron Valley and washed all the way down the brook Kidron all the way to the Dead Sea. It still drains that way today. And so as Jesus, after Passover, began walking with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane from the upper room, they had to cross the brook Kidron. So think about the fact that as Jesus went down and crossed that brook and went to the Garden of Gethsemane, the brook Kidron was probably still running red by all the blood from all the lambs that were portraying Jesus Christ. After Christ's late night arrest, Peter's denials, and a night in prison with Caiaphas, in the early morning light, as it began to dawn, hundreds and then thousands of Judeans began to line up with their lambs at the temple for their Passover lamb to be sacrificed. Allow your minds to retrace the events of what happened on what we call Good Friday, which was the Passover for the Judeans. The Passover schedule that God followed in the scriptures went something like this. The Levites had just opened the doors to the temple so the crowds could enter to offer their sacrificial lambs as families. So at 9 a.m., This was the specified time for the Passover lambs, and at that exact moment, three events took place. While Israel's high priest was tying a Passover lamb for the nation to the temple's altar to await its sacrifice, each head of each household took a knife and prepared to slaughter a lamb that he would sacrifice for his family. See, the family came carrying their lamb, The father held the lamb, the priest gave him the signal, and he sacrificed the lamb for his family. But at that very moment, outside the walls of Jerusalem, Jesus was being nailed to a cross to hang and to bleed for six hours, both the lamb at the temple's altar and Jesus as the lamb of God. Both awaited death the little innocent lamb in the temple, and the lamb of God hung on a cross. And then, at 12 noon, as thousands of individual lambs continue to be brought into the temple, the sky begins to darken, and the crowds inside the temple grow silent and pensive, and only the light of the temple torches illumined the darkened courtyard. The flickering lights shined off the pavement. The pavement of the temple was wet with the blood of thousands of lambs. And at that moment on Calvary's stark mountain, God the Father, the final high priest of all creation, placed his holy hand on the head of his only begotten son, allowing the sin of the world to descend upon him. In the dark, while the stones of the temple ran with that blood of thousands of lambs and goats, the Lamb of God was spilling his life blood outside the walls of the city. And then, while the father in each household slaughters the lamb for the sake of his family, God the Father was slaughtering his holy lamb for the sake of the world to save all who would accept Christ's gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Well, at 3 p.m., or exactly as the Bible says, the ninth hour, the high priest began to ascend the altar in the courtyard of the temple. And he took the little lamb that had been tied there all day to sacrifice him on behalf of the nation of Israel. Unstopped by the unusual darkness that had covered the land for three hours, the high priest carefully places his hands on the head of the lamb and slides a razor-sharp knife across the innocent throat, spilling its lifeblood. And at that very moment, Barely able to lift his blood-splattered face toward heaven, Jesus thundered out over the city of Jerusalem in triumph. It is finished. One word in Greek, tetelestai. 
which by the way is the very same word that, that has been found in the records of the Roman courts when a, when a criminal finished his sentencing and his time of prison, they would hand him back his certificate of his crime and they would stamp across it to Telestai, paid in full. The payment's done for your crime. Jesus said, it's finished. As the songwriter said, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. The Bible says basically the message of salvation is Christ became sin for us. Now look at what Paul says about those six hours on the cross we celebrate tonight. He made him who knew no sin, the perfect, sinless, spotless Jesus Christ to become sin for us who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Basically what was happening is God the Father was looking down on Christ and saying, I'm treating you like you have done what they have done and will do. I'm gonna treat you that way. I punish you, my son, like you committed their sins. Now, why did Jesus say, take that cup from me? We talked about that Sunday night. Think about what God was doing to him. God was looking at Jesus and saying, I treat you like you are self-sufficient and self-righteous and consumed with yourself and puffed up with selfish ambition. God treated Jesus like he was greedy and lazy and gluttonous and a slanderer and a gossip. God treated Jesus like he was a lying, conceited, ungrateful, cruel adulterer. Jesus became our sin. Jesus became my sin. God treated Jesus like he had practiced sexual immorality, ingested pornography, filled his mind with vulgarity, gave himself up to homosexual passion and lusted after what was forbidden. And God treated Jesus like he had with all his heart loved pleasure more than God. And God treated Jesus like he hated others and murdered them with the bullets of anger fired from his own heart. God treated Jesus like he oppressed the poor and ignored the needy. God treated Jesus like he loved money, prestige, and honor. God treated Jesus like he had worn a cloak of outward piety, but inside was full of dead men's bones as a hypocrite. God treated Jesus like he was lukewarm and easily enticed by the world. And God treated Jesus like he was filled with envy and rage, bitterness and unforgiveness. God treated Jesus like he had a razor tongue that lashed and cut with criticism and sinful, judgmental attitudes. God treated Jesus like his mouth was a fountain of condemnation and obscenity, like he had no self-control. God treated Jesus like he was a betrayer who stirs up division and factions. God treated Jesus like he was a drunkard and a thief. You see, God was, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was looking at each one and seeing the sum of our sins and treating Christ like he had committed those sins. Basically, God was punishing Jesus, saying, you're an anxious coward, you do not trust me, you mock your parents, you are an unsubmissive wife, you are a lazy, disengaged husband, you file for divorce, you crush the parable of my love for the church, and the list of your sins goes on and on and on. That's what was happening for six hours. That was Good Friday for us and bad for Jesus. Christ became sin for us. God said, drink my cup, and Jesus did. He drank it for hours. He drank it down to every drop of the scalding liquid of God's own hatred of sin mingled with his white-hot wrath against that sin. That was the Father's cup of 
omnipotent hatred and anger for the sins of any generation, past generations, present generations, future generations, omnipotent wrath directed on one man hanging on a cross. The father no longer could look at his beloved son, his heart's treasure, the exact image of himself. God looked away. So Jesus pushed himself upward and howled toward heaven. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And all that came back was silence. Silence. Separation. So Jesus whispered, I'm thirsty. And he begins to sag under that weight. The scriptures tell us for every sin on him was laid. So Jesus pushes himself up again and cries, it's finished, and it is. Every sin of every child of God has been laid on Jesus. He drank the cup of God's wrath dry. It's three o'clock, it's Friday afternoon. Jesus finds one more surge of strength and presses his torn feet against the spikes straightens his legs, and with one last gasp of air cries out, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then he died, shocking the centurion because it was so sudden. And in that moment, the mountains shake, the rocks split, the veil tears, the tombs open, and God says, the mission has been accomplished. The sacrifice has been accepted. That leads us to our celebration tonight because those who are saved are saved in Christ alone. God doesn't have a do-it-yourself kit that he offers us to just kind of do it ourselves and patch things up with him. He said, I only accept Christ's payment. You accept it or you reject it. You have the son, or you don't. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he were a sinner. He brought him, the sinless one, to be the substitute for sinners. He depicted on the cross all the sacrifices in the Old Testament, a substitute giving his life for the sinner. God killed Jesus with his wrath over your sin instead of doing it to you and to me. To put it another way, on the cross, God treated Jesus as if he lived your life, as if he lived my life. That's right. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he lived your life and mine. Listen to that. Think of that. That's how he treated him on the cross. Did you know what that does? If you look at, at 2 Corinthians 5, you know what it says in verse 15? Because he died for all, we who live should no longer live for ourselves. You see, there's, there's a, a response needed to the one who died on the cross. Verse 15 says, this one that became our sin makes us not want to live that way anymore. We don't want to, as it were, put more on the bill. But also, if you really think about it, verse 20 tells us, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If you realize how awful the wrath of God is against sin in Christ on the cross, why would you want to reject this payment and have to pay that bill forever in eternal darkness in hell? To put it another way, on the cross, God treated Jesus as if he personally committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe throughout all of human history. He treated Jesus as if he had personally committed every sin ever committed by every person who would ever believe, even though he never committed one of them. That's the cross. That's reconciliation. God treated Jesus like he committed them all. And communion is when Jesus said, do this remembering what I did. So what's tonight? It's when we remember the Lamb of God 
who face the wrath of God. Now what I would like you to do is please stand with me and as you stand, the men are gonna go and prepare communion for us and I'd like you just to bow your head with me and I'm gonna read these words that we're gonna sing as we celebrate communion and just in your heart, there should be one of two responses. If you know Christ, then it should be an overwhelming gratitude of thanksgiving and if you don't know Christ, it would be a time to say, would you pay the price for my sin too? Wouldn't it be wonderful to celebrate communion tonight as a forgiven, blood-washed saint headed for heaven? I don't assume that everybody here tonight has their sins on Christ, but I know you could if you'll ask. Think of these words with our hearts bowed before him. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Father, we've gathered tonight to remember our Savior. Good Friday was good for us. Horrible for you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for becoming my sin. Thank you for becoming our sin for every one of us who have asked for your forgiveness. May this Good Friday communion be a sobering, overflowing reminder of the wrath that you bore for our sin. Thank you for this bread as it portrays your body becoming our sin. May we with great thankfulness receive, hold, and celebrate you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <music>